Happy New Year to you. Thank you so much for starting off your New Year right with us today. Thank you for waking up a little bit earlier when I know you stayed up a little bit later last night. Uh, thank you for being here. Grab a Bible if you have them with you today, or you can follow along your Bible.com, Bible app, in the events section of that app. Uh, if you need help with that, just elbow your neighbor and ask them for a little help, and they can help you navigate that app uh, so that you can follow along on that outline. Now is also a good time to hashtag check in for Charity for us on Facebook. Uh, it's a new month. It's a, not only a new year, it's a new month. And so we're starting with a new local charity this month for every public Facebook check in we receive. We're donating $1 this month to Bay Area Habitat for Humanity. Habitat for Humanity. Well, it is that new year. It's that time of year where we look at our lives and we kind of decide to make some changes, to make some New Year's resolutions. How many of you have already thought of your New Year's resolution? Do you have a New Year resolution? And how many of you have multiple New Year's resolutions? Like you got two. Anybody got two? <coughs> And do you have three? Anybody still have three? Or four? Five, maybe? Anybody have five? We still got them going. All right, that's great. We are, um, we are going to talk about five things um, as we start this new year. Five. I'm going to help you. If you don't have any resolutions, I'm going to kind of help you with five of them this new year with this new series we're talking about today. Uh, personally, I'm not kind of really been ever that much of a New Year's resolution kind of a guy. Uh, in some ways, kind of, I think they're a little bit silly. I'm not making fun of anybody that has them or anything like that, but I just want you to kind of stop and think with me how silly they are for a moment, because what happens is we get to some point in the old year, right, where we decide, I need to make a change. We decide in the old year, I need to make a change. And then what happens is the silly part. Then what happens is we wait to make that change until the new year. Right? We wait until New Year. We wait until a turn of a page on the calendar. We wait until 2016 officially becomes 2017. Why do we wait to change? Why do we wait? Why don't we just change in the old year when it's still the old, old year? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I'm going to tell you why. Here's why we wait to change. Because we don't believe we can change and unless the whole world gets behind us. We don't believe we can change unless the whole world gets behind us. We, we don't believe we can change unless everyone else is also attempting to change at the exact same time, and we just kind of jump in on the bandwagon and change. So, so we wait until the one time a year when the entire world has decided that they want to try to change too, and we jump on that bandwagon for change, and then the new year gives us this extra measure of you know, belief in ourselves that we can do it, that we can change. There is an optimism for change in the new year like no other time throughout the year, but as soon as the new year just becomes the year, or worse yet, the old year, then we become pessimistic and stop believing that we can change. Because the hardest part of any new change is simply believing you can change. The hardest part of any new change is believing you can change. Now, the hardest part of getting people right to exercise in the gym, believe it or not, is not the actual exercise part. Like lifting weights seems hard, but it's not really the hard part. Running miles seems hard, but that's not really the hard part. The hardest part of of getting people to exercise is getting people to believe that they can exercise and getting people to believe that exercise is going to change them. The hardest part of getting people to eat healthy and lose weight, you know, is not the actual diet part. It has nothing to do with the taste of vegetables. It has nothing to do with having to learn how to cook or anything like that. The hardest part is trying to get people to believe that they can make a change in their diet and that that food that they eat will change their bodies and their lives. The hardest part of any change, of any resolution, is not really the action that the resolution requires. The hardest part is the belief that you can actually change. And, and, and we all have this kind of belief, this disbelief really, hidden deep inside of us because we all believe that we can't change in some way. We have something that we've given up on in our lives because we just believe we can't change. What is it for you? What do you believe that you can't change? What have you given up on? Maybe it's one of the classic New Year's resolutions. <coughs> Uh, maybe you don't believe that you can lose weight. Maybe you don't believe that you can, you know, exercise or stay on a diet, or you don't believe that you can stop smoking or stop dipping or stop drinking or something like that. Or maybe you've given up on a relationship, right? Maybe you've given up on believing that your marriage can be any different, or maybe you've given up on a relationship with your sibling or, or with a parent or or with a child or, or with an in-law. You don't believe that that relationship can be better. You've given up on forgiveness with them and, and you've written them off, you don't believe that they'll, you'll, you can ever forgive them because of what they've done to you, what change do you believe is impossible for you? We just believe that it's impossible to change sometimes. And, that, and that's why we wait until the new year to, to change because we believe that the new year kind of gives us some sort of magical superpower of change. 
and we finally believe that we can change because everybody else is behind us. So we're kicking off this new year with a message series called Five Easy Steps to Wreck Your Life, where we're looking at five different beliefs that, that are holding us back from making changes that we really want to make in our lives. And, and each step of this wrecked life is a belief. It's a belief. It starts with something that we believe. A wrecked life and a ruined life, it doesn't really start with the things that we do and, or don't do. It really starts with the things that we believe. So we're going to talk about one of those steps for each of the next five weeks that we have together in January. And those five beliefs that we hold are the ones that wreck our lives. And so the first step to wreck your life, if you want to find out how to wreck your life, take notes with me today. The first step to wreck your life that we're talking about today is the foundation for all the rest of them. And step number one is simply believe you can't change. Believe you can't change. If you want to wreck your life, then believe you can't change. Now, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you simply cannot believe this. It is impossible for you to believe this. It is a contradiction of terms. It is a paradox. You cannot be a Christian and believe that you cannot change. Why? Because we believe in one singular event in all of history that convinces us that change, any change, all change, every change, that change is possible. And all Christians have this one singular belief in common. Now, we Christians don't agree on very much, but we all agree on this one singular thing because it is the most important belief in all of Christianity, the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is the reason you can change. The resurrection of Jesus is the reason you can change. The physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus from the grave. Jesus was dead for over a day and then he came back to life. So the resurrection of Jesus is central to the Christian faith. It, it is the one thing that all Christians everywhere believe in. And if they don't believe in that, then they're simply not Christians. Because you cannot be a follower of Jesus if Jesus is still dead. You can't follow a dead guy. You have to follow somebody that's walking around, right? And Jesus' resurrection also it promises us that we will be resurrected. That one day you'll be dead. Sorry for the bad news. One day you'll be dead. But the good news, Jesus will one day make you alive again. Jesus can change you from dead to life, even if you're completely dead. The resurrection is the reason you can change any change. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, starting verse 20, But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, lives, not lived or, or is, but he lives there in his body. He lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies, resurrected bodies like his, right? Glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. So belief in the resurrection of Jesus changes everything, including your belief that you can't change. Because if God can raise the man from the dead, then he can change your life. And if Jesus can change from dead to alive, then Jesus can change your life. If Jesus can change from dead to alive, then Jesus can change your life. If death doesn't stop Jesus, then what can stop Jesus? If Jesus himself can be beaten down and, and, and put into the grave and then lift himself back up, what makes you think that when you're beaten down, Jesus can't lift you up? If Jesus can raise the dead, then he can fix all your little measly problems that you're writing New Year's resolutions for this year. If Jesus can raise the dead, then he can help you to lose weight. If Jesus can raise the dead, how can, he can help you to stop smoking. He can help you to, to forgive. He can help your marriage, even if your marriage seems dead. Belief in the resurrection, it gives you hope. It gives you hope. You'll never give up if you believe in this belief in the resurrection. You'll never give up. You'll, even if it all seems lost, even if it seems too far gone, even if you seem like you have no chance at life, you'll know that in death, God is still with you, and God still will resurrect the dead. But you've got to believe that. You have to believe that. Because if you don't believe that God raised him, can raise himself from the dead, then when your marriage dies, then when your health fades, then when your life falls apart, then you'll just give up. Because death is the end for you. When you don't believe in resurrection, then there are times when it will be too far gone, 
and you'll never be brought back because you do not believe that you can be brought back from the dead. And so you will never change. It all comes down to that one belief, that most important belief, that God raised Jesus from the dead. It's that one belief that matters most. The resurrection is the reason you can change. So if the resurrection is the reason that you can change, then what reason do you have to believe in the resurrection? So today, I want to give you four reasons to believe in the resurrection. So I'm going to give you four pieces of evidence to help you believe in the resurrection of Jesus, and by extension, to believe that you can change because you believe in the resurrection. And thanks to a biblical scholar named Hank Handegraaff, these four pieces of evidence conveniently spell out the word feet. Not feet like you walk on, but feet like an event, like an amazing feat, all right? F-E-A-T. And so these four reasons are the feet that demonstrates the fact of resurrection. The feet that demonstrates the fact of resurrection. Here they are. F is the fatal torment of Jesus. The fatal torment. Jesus' crucifixion was fatal. <coughs> Jesus really was dead in the first place. Now, how is that evidence for the resurrection? Because some skeptics try to theorize that Jesus was not really dead in the first place in the tomb. Like, maybe you wondered that before, right? When you're thinking about the events of Easter and the resurrection, maybe Jesus didn't really die on the cross. You know, maybe he just sort of passed out, and then when they laid him in the tomb, he revived. It kind of sounds plausible, doesn't it? Until you think about what crucifixion involved, right? No one ever survived crucifixion. The Roman soldiers knew how to tell if someone was dead. They were not stupid. They were professional executioners. You know, at, when someone enters the death chamber in the Texas prison system, they don't come out of the death chamber anything but dead. It's the same with the Roman cross. <coughs> Excuse me. The only way you got off that cross was if you were fully dead. You know, they don't come off the cross mostly dead. This is not the Princess Bride, right? So the death penalty kills people. It is fatal, fatal torment. And besides the evidence for the competence of the Roman soldiers in killing Jesus in the first place, there's also medical evidence that's listed in the biblical scriptures, in the Bible, in the accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John about the blood and the pus that, that are pour out from the, the heart and the lung of Jesus as he stabbed in the side with the spear. And that's evidence of his asphyxiation. You know, because that's actually how you died on the cross, was suffocation. You were asphyxiated, right? And if there was any life, let's just say maybe there was life left in him, don't you think that his followers who went and buried him would have done everything in their powers to actually revive him then and there on that very day if, he, if there was any life left in him? Why would they leave him alone in a tomb by himself if there was any life left in him at all? You know, this was not a hospital that Jesus was being left in. That, you know, it's hard enough to be revived after some kind of traumatic event with a 21st century medical, professional medical staff attending by your bedside in a hospital. You know, and Jesus was what? Just supposed to just get better after laying on a rock in the hole in the ground. And even if he was only mostly dead, even if he was only mostly dead, that even if he did somehow manage to regain consciousness in the tomb and... What would he have looked like? Can you imagine what he would have looked like if he just kind of revived on his own in the tomb? I mean, he's beaten, bruised, whipped, stabbed, still bleeding probably. Would that kind of Messiah be at all inspiring to anybody? If he's walking around the tomb in this state. If his disciples saw this revived but easily mistaken for dead Messiah saying, come and follow me. See, I've defeated death. Look at me. Then they would say, uh -uh. if you won that fight, I hate to see the other guy, right? You obviously didn't win that fight. So uh, if, if following you means that, that I have to look forward to looking like you, then no thank you. I'm going to follow somebody else now. It would have been impossible for a revived but easily mistaken for dead Jesus to have inspired and galvanized a movement of, of people to all claim that this guy defeated death. No, his torment was fatal. That's the F. And then the E is the empty tomb. Because the tomb was empty. Now, why was the tomb empty? Because Jesus' body had been transformed, had been resurrected, had been made, made new, and, and Jesus was out walking around, talking to people, cooking, eating, and other things. Now, why is the empty tomb evidence for Jesus' resurrection? After all, some skeptics theorize this. They think, you know, maybe you thought this before. Well, maybe... People just got the wrong tomb. 
right? Like maybe maybe the disciples just sort of forgot where Jesus' tomb was and they accidentally looked in the wrong tomb and saw an empty tomb instead of the one next door where Jesus was laying still, still dead. You know, um, that seems plausible to us, but the supposed resurrection of Jesus caused such a, a controversy among both the Romans, the, the political leaders, and the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders, that those, all they, what they wanted to do was prove that Jesus wasn't resurrected. And, and they wanted to stop this Christian movement from spreading. The perfect way to do that would just be to prove that Jesus is still dead. And so if that, there's just a mix-up of tombs, all the religious or the political authorities needed to do is just go to the right tomb and pull out the dead body and say, no, Jesus is not resurrected. See, he's still dead. Here's his body. And the entire new religion of Christianity would have been stopped, would have been eliminated in its very infancy had they done that. So if it's just a mix-up of tombs, all the religious or the political leaders would have had to do is just produce the body, just show the body to other people. So that's the E. The A is appearances. Appearances. When we talk about Jesus being resurrected, we're not talking about Jesus' soul going to heaven. Right? And that's not resurrection. When a soul goes to heaven, the body stays here on earth. Okay? It stays in the ground. But Jesus' body and soul together walked out of the tomb on his own two feet. And that's an important <laughs> distinction, I think, because... Many people miss that point when we say that Jesus was resurrected on Easter Sunday. They think we mean that he, his soul just went to be with the, with, uh, the Lord in, in, um, in heaven. But, but he walked around on the earth for 40 days after he was resurrected. He walked around. He was talking to people. He went fishing. He cooked for people. He ate with people and more. And Jesus appeared in his resurrected body to over 500 witnesses, including people who were hostile to him, like Saul, right? Saul is, is a Pharisee. He was an enemy of Jesus. And, and after, after seeing the risen Jesus, he became a follower of Jesus. Now, why did he become a follower of Jesus if he was an enemy of Jesus? Well, because when somebody predicts that they're going to die and be resurrected and then actually does that, and they die and are resurrected, then you tend to follow that person and do whatever they tell you to do. And so everything about Saul changed at that point. Even Saul's name changed. It changed to the name Paul, our Apostle Paul that wrote a lot of our New Testament in our Bibles. So well, maybe you might say maybe the witnesses just hallucinated, right? Maybe they just thought they saw Jesus. The problem with, with that is that people don't hallucinate in groups. They don't have the same hallucination altogether. And, and at one point in the story, uh, they... The disciples hand Jesus a piece of fish that, that they broil, and he eats it in front of them. And hallucinations don't eat, especially the fish that you hand them. So here's the story in Luke chapter 24, starting verse 35. <clears throat> then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road, and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. And that's kind of important because these are, these are not stupid people, I and mean, they don't normally think when they see somebody they haven't seen in a while, oh, he must have been resurrected from the dead. No, that's not a normal thing. This is, this is new for them, too. And so they think, they think, well, maybe he's a ghost. Maybe I'm seeing a ghost. Verse 38, why are you frightened? He asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies as you see I do. <coughs> as he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. <clears throat> Still they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it as they watched. Now, ghosts don't eat fish that you broil yourself. Hallucinations don't eat fish, and you don't hallucinate in groups either. This, if this was a hallucination also, if it was just a hallucination, just like the theory of the wrong tomb, all the authorities had to do, the political leaders could have said, is, is nope, your, your guy did not raise himself from the dead. Look, here's the body. But obviously they couldn't do that, because remember the E, the empty tomb. Now, others theorized, well, maybe the tomb was empty because... 
you know, the disciples stole the body, and they just made up this story because they, they wanted to make up this kind of weird cult and spread this, this, these strange ideas and become powerful leaders themselves in this new cult. But that's the least likely story of all because they received no benefit to fabricating this story. In fact, the way that the disciples lived after Jesus' resurrection is the last piece of evidence in these four pieces, the T in the feet that demonstrates the fact of resurrection. The T is the transformed disciples. The disciples lived a completely transformed life. Not a life of fame and fortune, not a life of power and prestige, no. Instead, they were transformed by the resurrection, and they were now unafraid of death. That's how resurrection transforms you. You're unafraid of death. Because think about it, if, you're, if your leader, if your master, if your lord has just defeated death, has just taken on the most gruesome, the bloodiest, the most horrific death imaginable, and then been completely transformed, then you probably wouldn't be scared of any kind of death either. You'd be like, death? Is that all you got? Right? I've seen what's on the other side of death, and I'm not afraid anymore because I've seen him. So the disciples were transformed. They were unafraid of death. And so as Josh McDowell writes in Evidence for the Resurrection, he says, as a reward for their efforts, however, those early Christians were beaten, stoned to death, thrown to the lions, tortured, and crucified. Every conceivable method was used to stop them from talking, yet they laid down their lives as the ultimate proof of their complete confidence in the truth of their message. So why would the disciples steal a body and spread a false rumor, a false message of resurrection, when all they had to gain for themselves, all they would be rewarded with for this conspiracy, would be torture and death? I mean, do you willingly submit to torture and death for something you know to be alive when there is absolutely nothing for you to gain? But the disciples had been truly transformed. They were unafraid of death, unafraid of anything life could throw at them. And the disciples believed that Jesus had been risen from the dead, and therefore, because of their belief in the resurrection of Jesus, they had the ultimate hope, ultimate hope, that nothing, not even death itself, could stop them. So these are just a few pieces of evidence for the resurrection of Jesus that I hope will kind of spark some thought in, in you this new year. I hope, I hope that they will start this, um, this New Year's resolution for you to take seriously what the belief in the resurrection actually means for your life. Because the resurrection is the reason that you can change. Your, your New Year's resolutions have no hope unless you believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Because if, if the resurrection of Jesus is real, then that means with Jesus' help, with his help, you can overcome anything in your life. Anything at all. Any sin, any death, any brokenness. You can overcome it. By the power of the resurrected Jesus, your dead marriage can be resurrected. Your failure at employment can, be, can, can see victory. Your estranged family relationships, wherever they are in this world, can be restored. Your broken down and out of shape body can be made whole and healed. Paul himself, changed by the resurrected Jesus, writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, he writes, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. If you believe in the resurrection, then you have the Spirit that raised Jesus <coughs> from the dead, living within you. I mean, that is a powerful spirit that can change you. Anything is possible this new year and every day of this year because Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. Now, every week we remind ourselves of this resurrection as we gather together on a Sunday because we gather together on Sunday mornings because it's the Lord's Day. It's the day that Jesus was resurrected. So just coming together on Sunday, we remember that Jesus was raised from the dead. We remember that all things are being made new, including us. We can be changed. And then we also remind ourselves of this truth weekly through the Lord's Supper, through communion. It's a meal of a piece of bread and juice, a bread dipped in juice that represents Jesus' broken body and his shed blood. And as we eat it, this is the amazing thing, as we 
eat that bread dipped in juice and it fills our bodies. We feel that bread and juice enter into our bodies. That same spirit, that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, we invite the spirit to fill our bodies. That same powerful spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, we invite him to fill our lives and to raise us up wherever we've given up, wherever we feel broken, wherever we feel like our life is dead. We invite that spirit to change us. And so I invite you to do that today as we take Holy Communion together. Let's pray and thank God for the gift of this meal and for the gift of resurrection, the gift of change. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you sent your Son, Jesus, here to die for us on the cross and to be raised from the dead to give us new life in a relationship with you. Holy Spirit, come not only to fill this place, but to fill this bread and juice and make it be for us like your body and your blood. So that as we eat it, we would be filled with your spirit. God, we want to be filled with that life-giving, powerful, resurrection spirit. As the bread and juice enter our bodies, fill our lives with that powerful spirit. God, don't let us give up on anyone or anything that needs to change in our life. God, search our hearts. Make us new. Help us to see what it is you want us to change. And then by your Spirit, give us the power to do so. Don't let us leave here unchanged, Lord Jesus, but empowered to be made new. Holy Spirit, come. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.